All right, well, this should work. I'm here in reality rather than virtually. And this is a Canadian session, by the way. I'm Canadian, although I've been in the UK a long time. Uh, and uh, Stephen showed you that shot. I wish I'd, I could give you a, sh a photograph of where I come from. I come from a place called Winnipeg. And Stephen lives in the uh, tropics compared to where I come from. Uh, it's currently minus 38 and windy. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm here, I guess. So I've been asked to talk a bit about open source. I mean, the Open University, for those of you that, that are more from the corporate sector, there maybe has been a perception open source as some odd thing that a few people dabble in. The Open University has made a major investment in open source. It's a strategic decision. Uh, it's not a case of an academic society to download Moodle and play with it. Uh, as you'll find out later, we've made a, a big investment in this. Uh, so it's a serious proposition. Uh, and also, there's always a notion, everybody's aware of the free stuff that's out there on the web. I mean, I personally, if I watch videos on a, on a laptop, I use something called VLC, which is a, a free media player, uh, works great, cuts across regions. There's free everything online. But that's different than, than open source. Oh, my God. Oh, the meeting has ended. Let's see if I can get rid of this. Uh, we don't want that in the middle, do we? do that. What's it going to come back to? Wow. Great. <laughs> no one thought about that, did they? How do I get back to PowerPoint? Do I just? Oh, yeah, I so, see. Yeah, yeah. I do that. Do that. Oops, except we've uh, jumped ahead a bit, so I'll flick through these very, very quickly. All right. Where are we? Oh, okay, so yeah, what we're talking about, open source, open source uh, as opposed to free software probably uh, uh, kicked off in the 90s. There were various things. Uh, there's this whole notion of freedoms. If, uh, I'm not going to read slides. Slides that have bullet points I won't read. But you can see that there's all sorts of things that you allow it to do. The difference between something that's free and something that's open source is the idea of community. And the open source projects that have worked and been effective and all. I'll go through a few of them very quickly in a minute, are the ones where an effective global community has, has evolved. So you're maximizing development resource across the world to everybody's interest. So that's where it's effective. There's actually something called the open source definition, which is a bit tedious, but there's a ton of stuff. If you just Google open source definition, you can find it all about you know, the things behind this and what those of us that work in this area uh, sign up to do. Personally, the, the notion that you can develop something and give it away, and still it's a business, viable business proposition. Uh, first, I, my first uh, encounter with this was in the early 70s. Uh, I was a student at the University of Manchester, and uh, I got involved, uh, I was doing my PhD, and got involved in organizing a rock and roll festival, a place called Bickershaw near Wigan, uh, which was an interesting thing to do. And top of the bill were the legendary uh, rock and roll hippie group called the Grateful Dead, for those of you that are old enough to remember the Grateful Dead. Uh, the famous Jerry Garcia pictured there. Now, part of the contractual arrangements to get the Grateful Dead to appear was that as organizers, we had to give, provide an area, a space, optimal right in the center of the viewing area for anyone who wanted to record the concert to record it, free of charge. Anyone was allowed to record it, and they had to be given this premier spot. And I couldn't understand why they did that until I discovered later that they were the largest grossing rock and roll band in the world, were for 20 years. They knew that if people took, got these awful recordings, they would like it, and then they'd go and they'd part with some money and buy the album. And then I suddenly realized you could actually give stuff away and make money. Uh, and in case you're wondering what a respectable-looking chap like me was doing organizing a rock and roll concert, this is what I looked like. Uh, uh, in fact, I looked a bit like Stephen Downs, didn't I? <laughs> uh, but I learned a lesson then that you can actually, you know, there's a business proposition around open source for, for you business people in the audience. Uh, there's a number of open source success stories. Uh, these are the best known of them. Uh, if I just uh, uh, flip through them, Linux, which was started by a guy called Linus Torvald, if I'm pronouncing his, his name correctly, in the early 90s, started fiddling around with Unix, decided it wasn't any good, and generated his own thing, uh, which grew into Linux, which is a huge community. Hundreds and hundreds of very, very major organizations worldwide now use Linux rather than Windows or uh, Mac OS. Uh, at, at, right at the root, at the heart of their business. Uh, the vast majority of the use of Linux is in, in the corporate world, uh, in offices and businesses that have adopted it. 
and yet it's an open source community. Linus is a benign dictator, if you like, and he has ultimate say, or he's got a group that have ultimate say, but there's a worldwide community. Very, very successful. The Apache Software Foundation started in the late 90s. Uh, another good example where there's a worldwide community of people. There's a, a committee that oversees it. 65% of websites worldwide are built on Apache technologies. So this is, this is an open source venture that more than half of the web sites in the world are based on. So another example of where open source is credible. Open Office, for those of you that hate Bill Gates and hate Windows, you've got the opportunity of downloading this thing. It works. You know, the only problem with Open Office, I would say, is there's some question mark about the effectiveness of the worldwide community. Uh, if there are bugs in Open Office, it's not clear who's going to fix them. I'm not. Uh, so there is a problem with that. But nonetheless, it is free. You can download it, and it works fine. Moodle, which I'll obviously say a bit more about in a bit, is becoming one of the better known LMS options. Uh, I view Moodle very much as an open source vendor rather than a commercial vendor. They, Moodle is a vendor proposition. The other major uh, LMS or VLE uh, offering is called Sakai. I'll say a bit about it. That's been based pr primarily in the United States, but now the center of Sakai is at the University of Cambridge. But I'll say a bit more about it. But those, Moodle and Sakai are most definitely the dominant open source uh, VLE or LMS uh, offerings. Moodle has had a phenomenal growth. It's hard to know why. Uh, those are just some of the stats that you can see. We know about over 36,000 deployments. Just as an example, Blackboard, which is a leading commercial LMS VLE vendor, has 3,500 uh, deployments. Moodle has over, it's probably 40,000 now. You know, now, now that can be anything from one person downloading it, and they're the only one using it, to deployments of 40,000. We have 400,000 students registered in our deployment of Moodle, and there's 180,000 live undergraduate students uh, using it. So there's quite a wide range, and I think only, there's only about 90 Moodle deployments that have more than 40,000. We'll see how it grows. But nonetheless, it has been a phenomenal growth. Uh, uh, and that's the, the standard, what you get out of the box. And you can see uh, if this works. Uh, it's a very tricky thing. Yeah, you can see just about over here, all the usual functionality. So for people who think there isn't, you know, there's limited functionality, almost every, all the functionality that you would get in a commercial offering is available in Moodle. Sakai, equally, you know, you see the, the uh, here all of the, well, this thing doesn't work very well, does it? Yeah. Here you can see all of the, the functions within Sakai. I think a lot of the, the, the functions in Sakai and the Sakai people are will be the first to admit are not as good as some of the newer uh, capabilities in Moodle. Uh, they have had less success at developing a global community uh, than Moodle. So obviously there isn't anyone to develop the tools. Uh, the main powerhouse behind, um, one of the reasons why Moodle has been successful is because it has a Linus Torvald equivalent, a guy called Martin Dugiamis who founded it. He acts as a benign dictator. Sakai did have their Linus Torvald, a guy called Chuck Severance. He's now stepped away from Sakai, so I do worry about Sakai going forward because Chuck was the powerhouse. He probably wrote half the code, uh, and so we'll have to see what happens. So, okay, open source isn't free. I'm sure you all know that nothing is free in this life. Uh, there are a lot of hidden costs associated with it. So if you're going to go for an open source LMS solution like we did, you've got a number of options. One is out of the box. You can just simply download Moodle and use it, and you'll obviously incur a minimal cost. You need... You need a basic PC to run it. The more users, you need a bigger PC or a bigger server. But in effect, you can download it out of the and use it out of the box. Another option is that it can be hosted, and there's both open source and commercial vendors that are offering it. We do some work with one of the Moodle partners called Moodle Rooms, based in Baltimore, I think. They will sell you a 40,000 license. They, in effect, will sell you a Moodle appliance. Uh, 40,000 users will charge you $10,000 for the license. Uh, and maybe charge you a dollar, a dollar a student, and they'll give you 24 by 7 support, and you don't go anywhere near the servers or anything. Your people have access to it. And there's a number of other people, Catalyst in New Zealand, the same, offer similar sorts of services. If you go to the Moodle website, you'll see that. So again, that is an option. You pay, but at least you don't have to worry about uh, supporting it. Uh, third option is you can in make some investment. You've got a few techies who are pretty clever. You can install it, and then you can do a bit of configuration or customization yourself. Straight away, you're getting into support costs. You probably are hosting it then, uh, and you, you need the smart technical people to do it. Or you can do what we've done. You can actually invest significantly in developing it. Now, one of the things at the heart of our strategy 
was <coughs> we bought in to the open source idea, so we've invested uh, significantly in Moodle, and I'll show you some of the things we've invested in. But everything we've developed, we then turn back into the Moodle community and into the core Moodle product. So everything that we spend on Moodle, the rest of the world gets in effect for nothing. They don't have to pay for that development. But that's the way open source works. That's the way Apache works. You get advantages of what other people's investments because they're going to invest that money anyway. So that's quite a unique, unique model. Most of the things that we have paid for, we've outsourced things to the Moodle community, for example, have then been part of the core Moodle product, which are available to everybody. So out of the box, that's what you get. If you download Moodle, you get something looking a bit like that. And, and you're up and running, you get all of that access to all of the tools. Uh, and there's, there's, you can get simpler, simpler uh, versions of it as well. There's a number, if you go to the Moodle site, there's a number of things you can download. You just go there, you download the product, takes a few minutes, and you're running Moodle. And you're using assignments and setting up assignments and quizzes. So you can obviously see the attraction for that academic that's a bit more forward thinking than some of his, other, his or her colleagues, where the institution isn't prepared to go out and spend hundreds of thousands on Blackboard or WebCT or one of the commercial products. That academic can set it up, run it on their own computer, and, and get their class to use it. So that's why Moodle has taken off, because it is so simple to use. Uh, and, and, and it's probably a good reason why so many people have bought into it. Uh, what we've had to do, because we made a major decision uh, to deploy it and put, in, put it at our heart of our online learning offering, uh, we've had to invest a huge amount. This is our service delivery team homepage, and that's where users go to, to find out all sorts of information about how they author content and everything that the product offers. So we've had to invest a huge amount in training and documentation, as you'll see in a minute, uh, through sites like this. Uh, and, and, and then this is just, we provide our users with all sorts of examples, demonstration sites where they can go. This is almost the vanilla standard look and feel that we've adopted for our courses. Uh, academics can go in and play with it, and then they can either request changes to what their particular course instance of it looks like uh, or not. And we have to provide an awful lot of support for them. Okay, we've invested, we started this in probably the beginning of 2005. And the formal program, VLE, program LMS, whatever you want to call it, the budget from January 2005 to end of July 2008, four and a half million pounds. So open source free, no, we've invested four and a half million pounds in it. Uh, but I thought you might be interested in where the money's gone uh, in terms of distribution. The blue line is the actual development. That includes technical testing, data rating the sites, all of the system development. So a little over 37% of the budget has gone to building the thing. The, uh, the maroon table, the actual administration and running of it, 36%. Now that's interesting, and we're just analyzing that at the moment and comparing it with other more commercial deployments uh, of major systems, uh, which don't look like we've invested much in the administration and the running of it, as we've had to do with open source. So maybe that's the first lesson. If you do a major deployment of an open source system like this, and you're investing a lot of money in, in enhancing it and improving the tools, you're going to have to invest a fair bit of money in running the program behind it. I don't know. We're analyzing this at the minute. You can see some of the other uh, investments there, library services. It looks like we've invested the least because there's a lot of library resources out there. You just hook into them. So the starting point are websites. We've got over 1,000 course websites. We don't have 1,000 courses. We've got about, I think, 600 courses, but a lot of courses have multiple presentations. So we've got well over 1,000 course sites. This happens to be the, our business schools. Uh, their look and feel, we've kept it very simple. We've had colleagues who say, oh, it doesn't look flashy enough. It doesn't look you know, sexy. But you know, our research with students is students don't care about that. They just want access to the functionality uh, and, and access to the environment itself. They're less concerned about flashy effects uh, that you see on the web all the time. Uh, I find it interesting, actually, that as Stephen was talking about Web 2.0, uh, Web 2.0 seems to have blown apart all of the rules about usability, user interface design, because if you use sites like Facebook, Amazon, eBay, they're absolutely awful. They float every rule of usability. There's too much stuff on the screen, yet I use Amazon, I use eBay, I don't have any trouble using them. You know, so maybe all those textbooks should be thrown away about usability and user interfaces. I don't know. Uh, obviously, we've had to generate a huge amount of resources. We st started off doing the obvious. We've taken a lot of existing materials. Uh, we put them in PDF format. Students can download them, downloadable PDFs. So a huge amount of resources, audio materials, et cetera, are going in there. It's interesting to note that at the same time that we've generated uh, all these websites, the Open University has very much adopted a blended learning approach. So in, the, in 2007, apart from generating over 1,000 course websites, 
we still publish 30,000 pages of print. Uh, we ship to stu we've got 730 either CD or DVD titles. Uh, we, we ship something like 600, 700,000 CD-ROMs and 200,000 DVD-ROMs. So, so we're producing a, a huge amount of media, and one of the reasons for that is bandwidth. Unfortunately, domestic broadband still is not good enough for us to do the sorts of things we do with video assets that we'd like to do. For those of you that have tried to use some of the new services, even the BBC's iPlayer, I don't know what your domestic broadband's like, but I'm contending with two or three daughters who are all online the same time as me, uh, and even the iPlayer, if you play one of these television programs, it runs for a bit and then stops and runs and stops. The other one, Juiced, which is an even more exciting online video product, is very, very poor. You know, I just don't have enough bandwidth in my house, even though I'm on a broadband connection. So we're still using all these other materials as well. That problem will go away eventually, I guess. Uh, the blog, basic blog tool in Moodle we're not happy with, so we're currently contracted out to completely redevelop the blog tool, uh, which will end up in the Moodle core. That's probably going to happen over the next few months. Uh, the wiki, we've completely redeveloped. We developed a brand new wiki, and that's now part of Moodle core in the current release. Uh, okay, it isn't media wiki, and the point is, with all of these individual tools, they don't set out. So the wiki within Moodle doesn't set out to be as good as media wiki any more than the blog tool will set out to be better than Facebook or MySpace, it isn't. The idea is integrating the tools together so the students have a seamless integrated set of tools. Our previous online model was a lot of very, very good products, but not really integrated very well. In the main, the integration happened in the student's head. Now we're trying to give them a better, more coherent, integrated learning environment. We haven't cracked it yet, we've got the tools, but there are other issues which I'll get to. Forums, again, uh, is something that we're planning to do a fair bit of development on. The universe, we've used a product called First Class. That's a Canadian product for a number of years, 400,000 users. Uh, at its peak, 500,000 users uh, of the system. What we're proposing to do until we're satisfied that the forum tool scales is we're going to uh, integrate it in as a web service. Stephen said a bit about web services. So again, for the student, they don't care. They don't care what system is being run. In fact, nowhere, anywhere online does the word Moodle appear. Uh, for students, because students are not interested in that. They simply want to access the services. They don't care that it's some open source thing called Moodle. Uh, calendaring, again, was very poor. We've invested a fair bit in completely redoing the calendar, and there's, there's a number of different views that students can get. A lot of our students are studying on multiple courses. We've got to have a way of presenting it so they can see what they're supposed to do in any one week across different courses, and stick personal stuff in as well. Uh, I said library resources, there's full integration with the types of resources that we want students to use. And being a distance learning institution, one of the problems we always had is that most of our students don't have access uh, to libraries. 75% of our students are in full-time employment. Uh, so the idea that we can allow our students to become more scholarly, that they've got access to the library resources that people at traditional universities take for granted uh, is a big, a big bonus. E-portfolio is something which everyone in higher education is interested in. We've developed from scratch, have, have, having looked at what's available in the open source community and the commercial community, from scratch an e-portfolio system which went live a few months ago, a few teething problems, uh, but we think the system is getting reasonably robust now, uh, and increasingly we're starting to build different applications on top of it, course-specific uses of the thing. Uh, again, it's, it's, this one is, while it's written in PHP, it's not in the Moodle core, it's a plug-in uh, to Moodle. Other areas we've, developed, uh, we've, we've done, we've done a huge amount of work on accessibility. This is just a document on the Moodle site, which we wrote, which is about the, uh, and it's really just a reminder to me to mention accessibility. We've invested a fair bit in enhancing accessibility features in Moodle. Uh, we've also invested a lot in roles and permissions. Uh, the basic Moodle out of the box, when we got involved uh, in 2005, simply knew about a teacher, a student, and an administrator. But we've got a much, much more sophisticated set of roles that, that our academics and our tutors use. So we've completely redeveloped uh, uh, the roles and permissions component. In fact, that was outsourced uh, to a company in New Zealand, and that's now part of the core Moodle product. We paid for it. And there's more. Uh, we've just uh, soon to go live at Easter with an audio recording tool. So students can actually record some of, the, some of our assignments, and they can attach a, an MP3 file to their assignments, which they submit online. Uh, that's going live as I said, an Easter polling tool where tutors can get students to vote on certain things where they're doing group work. Synchronous collaboration tools has been something that we've agonized over for quite a while. Uh, we've got an in-house system that's run for eight years. It does a lot of what WebEx does. It does, uh, it does a lot of what Skype does. In fact, it did what Skype did years before Skype. 
uh, but we never, we never try to market it or make it turn into a commercial product, but it's getting a bit long in the tooth. Uh, and we just simply haven't found anything in the open source world which is good enough. So the likelihood is we will actually be buying a commercial product uh, and it'll be, have to run alongside Moodle. We simply have not found anything and don't have the resource to invest in developing a major synchronous collaboration tool. Uh, offline Moodle is something that, that, that is, not, is now available. We're thinking about how to use it. The idea being uh, it works very similar to those of you that have PDAs and mobile devices that you sync with, say, an Outlook calendar. So a student goes offline. They do a lot of stuff in a forum. They do a lot of stuff, quiz activity, whatever. Uh, they then go online and it resynchronizes everything and everything that they put in the forum goes into the online bit and vice versa. And then they get everything back in sync and they go offline again so they can get on the bus with their computer and carry on working offline. Uh, one of the drivers for that, interesting enough, is that we've got the largest uh, student population in prisons uh, in the UK. Quite a thousand of students in prison. They don't have ready internet access. We also have a lot of students still on dial-up. I think only 65%, 6% of our students are on broadband. So there's a lot of people still on dial-up. So again, they're nervous about the cost of being online. So we think this will be quite, quite interesting. And then the next version of it will look more towards mobile Moodle and what does it mean? I mean, whether anyone you know, seriously thinks that, that I can display on a screen that size, you know, I personally, no, I don't think that's going to work. But then there are projection devices and new mobile devices which project onto walls. We'll see, but we're looking at what we can do. Japan, for at least three years, I think, the main mobile provider in Japan, uh, there, there are some Moodle, Moodlers in Japan have developed an online Moodle using Docomo, which is a Japanese uh, mobile ISP mobile service and people in Japan seem to be using it, but we're not convinced well, that necessarily works. Uh, okay, pitfalls and traps, just keep an eye on the time. Uh, well, one of the things is if you go down the road of developing stuff, uh, you've got a problem if you don't have some smart people because you don't need many of them, but you need them. Uh, the beauty of the web and the online world is that a few people can do some amazing things. Uh, I'm sure you know most of the, well, you, the YouTubes of this world, you know, it, it's not one man and a dog. YouTube got $10 million right at the beginning, but it still only was a few developers, but they needed cash to buy servers, et cetera. Uh, so you do need some, if you don't have the in-house people, you'll get in trouble. Uh, there are problems with outsourcing, to getting it hosted. You all know that for those of you that host, have services hosted. You know, we've not had those problems because we've not done it, but I've heard of other people that have had problems. So. You know, you've got to be careful of who you're working with and who you go to in partnership, which vendor you're going to, uh, you're going to use. Uh, another issue is that there's a big difference between customization and configuration. Configuration, you've got a system and you go and you tick a few boxes. I want this on, I want this off. Customization is when you're actually starting to do a bit of coding and change things. And then we all know what happens when you change one line of code, the whole thing can blow up in your face. So, and then it costs money. So beware of the differences. And obviously, escalating development costs. Something looks cheap to develop, and oh God, it doesn't quite work. And before you know it, you've spent a hell of a lot of money. Uh, outsourcing, again, there's unexpected costs, as we've discovered. You outsource something, and they come back, well, can't really do it for 10,000 pounds. It's going to cost 40,000 pounds. So, so outsourcing, you know, and, and the recent provides the National Health Service and, and the amounts of money, you know, where they've tried to spend billions. And it's not a surprise, almost that entire operation was a complete outsourced model and what a surprise that costs escalated and ended up costing way more than they thought. Wembley Stadium, all of these big projects, that happens. And then project management, you need project management. So just some of this, so these three guys almost single-handedly can do everything I need to do. You know, the guy sitting down looks after our Moodle infrastructure, the guy in the middle is responsible for assessment, and the other guy is responsible for just about everything else. And you give them a few other people and they can do everything. They're just ordinary geeky guys who can, who can do amazing things. But you've got to give them a good environment to work in. And we've got an open plan environment, which is great for the collaborative working that you need uh, to work with open source. Uh, the project management, we eat our own dog food, everything. The whole online learning, the Moodle development is done in wiki. Uh, and that's the front page of it. Uh, curiously enough, you see the word Bomora. We've always given the guy who leads the project the, the right to name the releases. And his predecessor was an American guy, and he named them after American mountains. The current guy is Scottish, and so each release is named after a Scottish whiskey. So hence Bowmore and Glenlivet. Uh, uh, and then this thing shows interesting things. So this is uh, one of the lead developers' uh, work breakdown uh, for the last release. And we work in two-week time boxes. So that's what uh, uh, the, the, these things are here, where you get uh, B1, so it's a two-week. 
but you see that, the, so this guy had a schedule, but suddenly you see not scheduled, not scheduled, not scheduled, not scheduled. Lyceum, which is our synchronous tool, suddenly started blowing up when students were acquiring Vista machines. So this guy had to take two weeks out of his work schedule to fix the bugs and work out why this product didn't work and now does. So you get these unexpected costs when suddenly Microsoft changed the operating system and all the students go to PC World and suddenly they're all running some variant of Vista. <coughs> if you really get in trouble, there's a government funded body called OSS Watch. They're a great bunch of people. They put on conferences, provide a ton of support, go to their website and they can help uh, with open source. Right, just a few more things. I was asked to talk about the Moodle support network. Uh, there's Mr. D himself, Martin Dugamis, a very humble chap. He founded Moodle and uh, now he's snowed under. Uh, he used to, he had a lovely slide that he used to show when he gave his talk about Moodle headquarters, which was a bungalow in Perth. And it was quite nice compared to the Microsoft campus and the Oracle campus. Uh, but anyway, they offer a number of support services, uh, hosting and consulting, etc. So this is, you know, there's Moodle partners. And so you go to these Moodle.com. Moodle.org is actually the commercial wing and then there's Moodle.com. So as I said, they are very much an open source vendor. It's not just a load of developers uncoordinated in any way. There is structure, there is coordination. And he has the ultimate say what goes in Moodle and what doesn't. If he says no, it doesn't get in. Okay, just one uh, couple of things I was asked to mention. You know, it's an open source commercial mashup. This is an attempt to depict our, our architecture and I don't want to get too, in too detail, but you'll see in the, uh, in here, in the, oh, this thing's awkward. In here, the, so these are all the Moodle tools in what tends to be called the application services, all the Moodle stuff, but then synchronous stuff is outside of Moodle. This is his first class conference system. That's a commercial product outside of Moodle. Uh, and while we've got a lot of Moodle stuff in here, if you go down here and look at the enterprise services which underpin it, Circe is our student admin system. That's a commercial product. Uh, CRM, we use Siebel. It's a commercial customer relation management system that we use to support students. And our content management, enterprise content management system is Documentum, another commercial product. So all of these commercial products are integrated in together with Moodle, fit for purpose. You know, not, it's not a religion, it's what works. Uh, okay, just to close with, so I think I'm just about out of time. You know, previously, the, and the reason that we've gone with an, an open source strategy is because previously the student had to adapt to the system, be it, you know, uh, apologizes for the jokey pictures, but, you know, maybe makes the point that it was all teacher and institution focused, pushing stuff down to the student. Uh, and the reality of the, the expectation now is that the system needs to adapt to the learners. Exactly what Stephen said a bit earlier. We're moving into a world, Web 2.0 world, where the expectation of learners is that they are at the center of the experience, not the other way around. They choose what they do. They choose which resources they access. So the you've got to place the student at the center. And in our view, the going the open source route around the learning tools gave us a better opportunity to do that. So rather than invest money in license fees, we've invested money in training for staff uh, and developing tools where we thought appropriate to give the student the learning experience we wanted to do rather than adapt the student's learning experience to the tool because that's all it did. So that's the reason why we did it. Uh, and so far, so good. You know, we're just at the po interesting point now where uh, we're trying to get our academics to engage with it. We've got a lot of people using the system. And uh, if I come back next year, I'll tell you how we got on. Thank you. Thank you.